So I've gone to hotels which are like literally construction sites where only certain areas are ready. They say yeah, everything will be ready, and then you'll realize, oh, the walls are beautiful, lights there, but the artwork isn't come. Wo China se aa raha. Atul Kasbekar was one. Yeah. His dear friend and a senior photographer. Atul was there. Sumi Chopra was there. So these guys had already come to India and they cleaned up all the big campaigns. They were specifically doing fashion. Even if I don't have an opening, I will always come and say, "Please come and meet me." I think lifestyle and luxury chose me rather than me choosing lifestyle luxury. Hi friends, it is said that a picture is worth a thousand words, and it's absolutely true. A picture is not just worth a thousand words, but it sometimes also leaves you speechless. And today, I have such a person as a guest speaker on our talk show, which is Kingly Talks at CCD in collaboration with CCD. So this this person has has made a mark in the Indian industry as one of the top best photographers in the luxury and the lifestyle photography. Uh, having uh, graduated from the prestigious Brooks University in uh, California and having worked in New York and Los Angeles, he then moved to India to start his career as a photographer. And within a span of around 20 to 25 years, he's made a mark as one of the top best photographers in this industry. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jairip Oberoi to Thinkly Talks as a lead. Welcome, Jairi. Thanks, Nikhil. Thanks for having me. How's it going? Uh, growing good, and thank you for accepting the invitation and being the first uh, guest for this particular thank show. You. Thank you. Very so, honored. if you can just uh, tell us what exactly you know, how well you started, you know, your career. Were you very? I mean, you were absolutely clear that you wanted to become a photographer, or? Um. Yes, I mean, I was always interested in the arts right through school, sports and arts. Um, and yes, I did come. We had a family of artists. Both my parents are creative people, um, so I went. Uh, you know, they very kindly uh, put together their funds, hard-earned money, and sent me to Santa Barbara, where there was a special. You know, it's a specialized photography school. So I was there for about three and a half years, and yeah, so that's how I. But I think the big spark actually that happened, which I really understood what's going on, is when I went to school, and there were. Many international students, and when you are given one assignment, and how different people from different cultures interpret that, I think that was the epiphany. I was like, okay, this is magical. When you are exposed to your co-peer photographers, and we're all doing the same thing, and coming out of these wonderful results, I was like, there is so much more to this. So I think that really ignited. Say, okay, this is definitely going to be an exciting career. And who has been a, a, a big influencer in making this decision? I would say, you know, apart from my own creative alignment, my parents were very helpful. My father was a photographer, and um, but he did something very different to what I do today. But he was very inspiring to get me going. And once I was in the business, once I got into studying and all, you know, influences just come, come to you. It's either through another student, or it's through a teacher, or it's through another photographer that you aspire to. So influences. Keep evolving as you evolve. Great. And how was your experience post your graduation from the university in uh, Los Angeles and in New York? <clears throat> so when I finished, uh, uh, I did an internship in LA midway through. So I finished two years of school, did an internship uh, in LA with uh, some photographers there, and then I came back to school because I had to put some more funds together. So I was actually working. Illegally, um, uh, you know, because it is expensive. Uh, so I went back to school. Then I completed my graduation, and then I went to New York to work with a photographer. And uh, you know, I think internship working with those guys is just you know a very crucial part of your education because you've seen how it's done in school, but working immediately thrusted into New York into a high pressure situation that that experience is 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 cuts you sets you up for life. So you had mentioned earlier that uh, in I think in Los Angeles you worked with under a photographer who has his own he had his own jet and he specialized yeah. into liquid uh, yeah. photography. It was it was in New York. It was in New York. Yeah. So when I finished my school, I took literally the first internship that I would get because it's very hard to get internships there, and I worked with this photographer and you know he started you know on his own the humble beginnings mm -hmm. 
and yeah he through photography and through shooting for pepsi and coke and all the beers all pepsi and coke both would shoot with him and one weekend he's like what well, do you want to go to nantucket which is this you know beautiful little weekend getaway i said yeah great how are we going he said in my aircraft oh. and i was like okay <laughs> so we went to nantucket uh, for a weekend he was very sweet I mean, I was like, "Wow, you got your own aircraft, shooting pictures of Pepsi and Coke." <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> that's amazing. So, tell me, when you were working with him under the photographer, uh, and during during the uh, the initial stages, were there certain values that you learned or imbibed in your own culture or in your approach towards photography? Too? Absolutely, and has it helped you over a period? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it it cuts you completely. It just shapes you up completely. Working with a good mentor. I didn't realize the value of those, you know, almost a year I worked with him. It was even now when I look back at it, everything that I learned from him, um, I, I use it in my daily life. And not only that, here's the beautiful part of it: I've had so many assistants who've worked with me and who've, uh, who've gone back, and I catch up with them. They said, "You won't believe it. Um, things that we did at the studio, we do it at home in our daily lives." And he says, "Our parents just are so shocked to see that change in us." So. what i learned from the studio it goes into my daily life and it percolates into their daily life it's organization the value of time i remember the first day i was in new york i was 20 minutes late because i didn't know about the subway systems and i got lost a couple of times and he didn't say anything he didn't care whether i was my first day in new york i didn't know the subway because early there was you didn't do you didn't do public transport and he just made me sit there for one hour oh. so before he <laughs> even and then the first things he told me is you're late and then i said i will never be late again anywhere you know is it was tough so every day when i used to go to the studio i used to be there 15 minutes before him sit in a cafe have my coffee watch him enter the studio and then 5 minutes later i would you know so that uh, one small incident yeah, actually yeah. shaped you you never late i mean Great. try and be on time so and when you come came back to india uh, was it a easy cake walk for you getting assignments and uh, which particular genre of photography you, did you start with So after I finished my, you know, obviously liquid, there was no Pepsi, there was no Coke. I came back in 1992, so there was no Pepsi, no, there was no real, you know, liquid photography. People didn't even conceive it. Remember, we, we had film at that time. Yeah. So shooting splashes on film was inconceivable because it's expensive, right? Each Polaroid, you know, the issues. You know, we worked together, and yeah. you know how it was trying to get, it, you know, if if the client said, yeah. Three niche Polaroids. Karna hai. We don't have the budget for the fourth one, so you're shooting blind, and then you're shooting liquid, and then you have to shape the liquid in, in a certain way. Um, uh, sorry, I totally digress. What was the question again? No. So uh, when you came back to India, how was how how did you start getting the assignments? All right, like a, right, 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 right. Did you have an initial struggle period? And how did you uh, break through that? So you know when I came. uh back to india to to start my career there were two three colleagues of mine who had already come back atul mm-hmm. kasbekar was one yeah. his dear friend and a senior photographer atul was there sumi chopra was there so these guys had already come to india and they cleaned up all the big campaigns and they were specifically doing fashion i knew that i will do everything else except fashion simply because it was not something that drew my you know it didn't draw my interest so much um so i was very clear that I was in no hurry. I was in no rush. I said I will start very steadily because they'd come back, and I saw they immediately jumped on the big campaigns, and um, I didn't want to do that because I wanted to learn from my mistakes. You know, you can't suddenly step onto a big campaign for me without making a few mistakes, without learning your entire craft. It's like a, you know, you have to be a producer as well as a photographer. So I took my own time. Mm-hmm. I didn't have any. I don't think I was not. Like oh here I am I need to make this big announcement I was more about let's do it slowly let's learn the craft let's work with the system understand the system so I've had a steady growth in my career I have no regrets about it and what that. what kind of photography did you start up with anything that I would get paid yeah. for <laughs> absolutely anything um, I wanted to push for uh, you know trying to do high speed liquids and all because that was my niche I figured that thing out and nobody was doing it here nobody had even heard of it here. but i was doing a lot of still life and uh, at that time you had to do many different things so we would do portfolios of you know models also Model. and we would do some amount of location work like interiors and then but my forte was going to be still life in the studio great and uh, throughout your entire journey i think it's 25 years of being a being a photographer more, more than that so how uh, 
why did you first of all choose lifestyle and luxury and hospitality in specific as your niche uh, was it a conscious decision or is something that triggered like the creative sense in that yeah this is where i find more uh, expressed as a pro- as a creative person i think life was it a business call no, i think lifestyle and luxury chose me rather than me <laughs> choosing right. lifestyle luxury so i started with you know with figuring out what to do and as time went by i started you know you have to be fluid at that time so i started doing a lot of cars for of course i did liquids i started shooting a lot for pepsi uh, while i was doing pepsi i had a lovely rapport with the art director we did some celebrities also um, tough to shoot tough to shoot celebrities i did whole waiting and all i don't do celebrities my good friend avinash gorikar is a yeah, outstanding uh, outstanding he's really in that he's fab so you know because it requires so much patience and time and in spare way so i did a lot of product shots you know uh, for them and uh, then i did a lot of food i did a lot of work for unilever we did a lot of packaging for them then i did a lot of cars so i went through these phases 5 6 years and then i don't know the, the business would just take me to something else and uh, but i was always doing hotels maybe few hotels in the beginning and 95 something interesting happened i got a call from a friend of mine at taj who said listen there's an australian photographer coming down he's looking for an assistant and uh, do you know anyone i said how long is the shoot so he said it's about 15 days i said i'll come so is you sure i said yeah i said you get to learn you get to travel let's see how these foreigners work and in indian conditions because i worked in new york and i saw how respectful they are and out there that professionalism hadn't come so i went to this guy and uh, i saw how they worked and the way they worked is they said these are our ethics that we do in australia this is what we're going to do in india so they didn't get pushed around and then i worked with him and that really molded me i think this was the big you know uh, molding part uh, for me and um, it was just the most perfect uh, genre of photography to do for me okay. it suited me the best because it had everything in it it had lighting in it it had lifestyle it had styling and the clients would just kind of leave you and say boss this is a short list this is what you have to cover if aapko thoda extra karna hai and you had your own version of approaching those shots also in the beginning there was the art directors would come with you the best ones that i worked with were not there to tell you how to compose how to they were there for the styling and the feel of the picture that's what i learned a lot and over time then you know hotels would contact you directly they started weaning out the agencies so it was beautiful there was no client there was nobody <laughs> from the agencies I, i do miss some of the creative people who were great like zerxis baria and lc nanji and these people would actually be on shoots these are like legends divya thakur um, so amazing work so i learned a lot from them so i realized it's about storytelling and styling you're your own creative person you are in a beautiful environment it's a lot of hard work mm. because you have different challenges but it's like this is tailor made it's perfect it's bit of everything it's food it's models it's interiors it's uh, what more do you want i know it's so, a best kept secret i think <laughs> hotel photography so that's something really nice you spoke about right now is about storytelling which i want to emphasize more on uh, especially for uh, uh, budding photographers or photographers who still haven't found their you know which genre of photography they want to actually so sure. uh, expertise into so uh, i have uh, you know i have been through your insta uh, handle and i must tell you uh, i've seen i follow a lot of photographers but your works is amazing thank you uh, you know i was just thinking that other day like i saw a few of the photographs and they were actually uh, it's not a still but i feel that it's like a film and then it's just a part of a you know because there is a lot of moment yeah. within the still image and there is a beautiful connection between the architecture the ambience yeah. uh, the surroundings and the the character whether is a prop or whether is the person over there in the yeah. image so there's a lot of storytelling which is happening Correct. so how do you achieve that i mean is there something which is spontaneous on the say, uh, uh, at the location or is it something that you first when doing a reiki you come out with some ideas and then you experiment so to make things look the way they are to make things look spontaneous and natural this i am a control freak first of all <laughs> i do a lot of pre planning lot of ground work so i create a format saying bhai this is my storyboard this is where i'm going to tell my story and i align certain elements and then i like to keep one x factor in that 
creates that movement. So maybe it's a beautiful frame and there is uh, sunlight that will suddenly come at so and so time and create this little dapple of light. Yeah. That dapple of light has been studied. <laughs> I know, I have, you know, I know at this time I'll get I this know, dapple you of need light. You to understand which location, where, Correct. geographically where you're yeah. located. Oh. Absolutely. What time is sunrise, sunset? Sunrise, sunrise. If there's a model, what is she doing? Is she doing some stereotypical thing? So many times I'll say, listen, just do your thing. Just keep moving around. Just naturally do. Just be natural and, and create that little X factor that throws things slightly off. Sometimes, uh, yeah, you need to create that movement by letting, letting, let, letting go of some controllables. Mm. And that you'll pick that frame that is just marrying with everything at the right time. Amazing. So, and styling is super important, you know, the aesthetics, it's luxury lifestyle, it's aspirational. Uh, so we do try and create um, some, I like to create an image which I think is, is kind of timeless. And you don't, I mean, when you create something with emotion, with, with a little storytelling, it should look fresh even five or 10 years from now. So that's what I hope. And I'm happy to see some of my pictures shot 12, 15 years ago are still on the websites on Absolutely. big brands, not just small brands. On big brands, they're still there. So that's happy. I'm Amazing. happy with that. And uh, so when you uh, do this particular storytelling, I mean, the kind of images that you shoot, is there a particular case study or something which you had to go or do something really weird out of the box to get a particular shot? Yeah. yeah. Something was like completely out of your comfort zone. And yeah. There are, there are many such stories. I usually, uh, uh, there are many. Uh, when you say out of the box comforts, the one thing that comes to my mind is this shot, which we did in Maldives, which is an exterior of a hotel where we had to build is a 20 foot scaffolding, more than 20 feet in the middle of a lagoon. Wow. And we had these poor people, you know, struggling the whole night, making this huge platform, which is in the middle of the sea in Maldives. And that was, I mean, it's a long story. I won't get into that, but. Yeah. You had to do things like that. Not only so after they build the whole platform, I said, they're about eight feet too short. So then, with great guilt, I say, "Ye pura platform na, eight feet under lelo." Oh and I got the dirtiest looks because they worked literally eight hours to set up that platform. But it it is off. So yeah, you have yeah. to time the tides. Yeah. Whether it's a low tide, high tide, and the, yeah. the perfect time, so you don't yeah. miss that particular. Well, luckily, this place didn't have too many tides. Maldives okay. is fairly still water. But it is rough water. Mm. And then there was this whole camera moving. And I remember the clouds were coming up. It was thunderstorm and Yogesh was my assistant with me. We were both on this platform and it was like, so I told Yogesh, I said, remember, if this thing falls, the waves are going here. Then I planned this whole thing, let the camera and everything go down. We jump backwards so the scaffolding doesn't fall on us. So he's like, we were literally scared doing that shot. And it's one of my favorite shots that there. Wow, you know, I would love to see <laughs> it. share it with you. Uh, now, coming more from uh, the business perspective, yeah. you know, uh, when you're doing uh, or approaching hospitality uh, photography or luxury photography for that matter, uh, there are a lot of brand standards. I, being uh, a brand uh, designer, I understand the importance of brand guidelines and uh, does it take it off, tick you off sometimes? Like there's so much, you know, the the pillow needs to be like this and the lighting needs to be like this and there are certain and each brand like a Hyatt or a Taj or the Four Seasons or Starwood would have their own particular guidelines. How do you approach that time and yet create that magic? Okay. Because uh, frankly, I've, I've seen a lot of photography for a lot of these brands, but I'm, you know, I've not seen the kind of work that you've been doing. So how do you achieve that magic? Every time you do a job, they give you this whole brand guidelines stuff that is usually written internationally by international brands. These brands are written for, you know, like literally they think we're third world photographers or third world countries. I don't understand certain aspects of photography. So these brand guidelines, frankly, there are maybe 10% of the brand guidelines that are of consequence. Most of them, are, it should look very inviting. Now, inviting means it's different. What do you think? And I think inviting is different, you know. Um, so I usually don't get into too much of subjective guidelines. Huh, the mota mota I take. So for example, Hyatt used to have guidelines that say, even Marriott has that, certain brands. Our room should look exactly like the way the guest would expect it or the way it is set. 
as soon as they enter. We don't want any tea set or we don't want any cookies or fruits uh, that are not there. Don't put that there. So I do have an issue with that because you might do that today, mm. but six months from now, a GM would come and say, you know, he must have it. And he may make a little tweak to that. Mm. Or you can't use a cup of, tea, you know, a teacup that is not a part of the standard. Yeah, but in six months time, somebody may come and change the crockery and cutlery. So I tend to push this. I'm, I'm not the best photographer for those hotels that are very stringent and they have these guidelines because I'm not bringing any part of my storytelling. Mm. The beautiful, there are many photographers who are very good at technically executing them. Get those. I love working for Taj because they understand Indian hospitality. They understand warmth. Hotels are about coming in and making you feel, you know, warm, inviting. And you throw in things. You'll put a tea set that's not there. If I'm shooting at Rambagh or uh, Umed Palace, these are the highest level of luxury probably in the world, right up there. So they, the GMs out there are, are smart enough to say, look, can we use this kind of tea set instead of that? Because a lot of, you know, so anyway, these are small swaths of florals. Can we use these orchids instead of the flowers you use? So they are accepting to that. We've done, I've done shoots, experiential shots, so out of the, you know, park, where we set up this thing, which they didn't even have, they didn't even, ex they didn't even expect it. And suddenly they love the picture so much. They actually said, wow, oh, this is a cool idea. We should actually utilize this that. for as a service that we do many. Okay. Props that I've bought, they said, can you please leave this tea set <laughs> behind? It's really cool. We'd like to utilize that. So that is really satisfying. So uh, now in terms of uh, brand guidelines is one part of it. The other is uh, the marketing goals or the marketing, uh, uh, you know, their vision. How do you align your creative uh, output to the marketing goals, especially from the hospitality industry? Um, you know, my, I don't want to get too carried away with that. I'm already carrying a lot. I mean, I'm doing the recce. I'm, you know, I'm styling. I have my own, uh, I, I, I buy my own stuff for shoots. I go myself. We'll do all the styling. My job is to give them uh, a beautiful image, mm. which they can, uh, you know, utilize for marketing. Uh, my job really ends there. What they do with those images is their problem. Um, it's not my issue. In most cases, you know, they, I understand what they're going to do with it. So, what they do beyond once I deliver is not my issue. Great. Um, till whatever the projects that you've done, which is your the most favorite that you find that like really wow images and uh, the location was amazing. You know, I, every image, I mean, uh, I was, before every shoot, even today, I, I get nervous, I get stressed. And I think that's the most beautiful emotion that I can have because the day you're not nervous and you don't have a sleepless night <laughs> before a shoot means you should quit. That is the time to leave. Um, so I have that on every shoot, uh, on every shot. Because if you, sometimes I feel like if a shot goes too easy, which it never does, um, because you're always trying to push that bar. Hey, yeah, if you're done with this shot on time, okay, can we try a different cookie? Can we move this cup? Can we try a different cup? You'll go on pushing it till the very last minute. So I can't say every project is very fulfilling. In fact, some of my small projects that are really challenging have taught me a lot. Sri Lanka was phenomenal because we were exposed to a brand that was upcoming. You know, it was not fair to compare it to something like uh, uh, an Umed or whatever, but it was very exciting. It was great fun. Probably the two locate, I mean, Maldives is always great fun. It's very challenging because it's actually quite tough working in Maldives because of the light. You're always dealing with natural light and has to be present. And then you're matching that with your flash. So that's balancing light is challenging. And I would say palaces. Oh, palaces I, I are. remember the shot of Taj and it's... So awesome. Palaces. And the way you've compo done the entire composition where the, you know, you get the beautiful, uh, uh, the geometry of the architecture yes. and the way the perspectives come together yeah. and suddenly the entire uh, place becomes alive. Alive and the regalness, the royalty. Absolutely. I mean, the whole thing is that when you, when you see an image, you need to be drawn to that. Drawn and so I want to go there, you know, and that's the key part of... Uh, and you know, each, each and every image of your does that. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, during the entire journey, tell me what uh, keeps you inspired or this particular passion alive all the time. 
is that something that you look forward or is that something that you go to to stay inspired do you follow some uh, you know practices you know the when you get that call that you have to do this project and it's so and so and then you will i will usually be called for more exciting projects i'm not the guy for business hotels uh, although i do do them but there are others who will do a fairly decent job so the story of the the inspiration starts when you get that call and then they tell you this is the hotel and then they send you this and then you get very excited about that so your mind starts thinking immediately mm. you know and you're always connecting from your past experience so many this hotel acha it reminds me of this or oh, that work that didn't work and then your mind starts starting the planning like an architect like an interior designer you know your your planning starts right there how am i going to make it look stylish or oh you were doing a spa okay we're going to get models okay this is the kind of model i want okay she should xyz we'll do the casting we'll send out so that creative process is so focused on the solution to that unique property that i don't need to look at anything else except my uh, my bank of experience or exposure to lifestyle luxury and that property that's it i don't need i i won't go to pinterest and start researching uh what it is it's that's how it's a little personal no no researching uh rarely i mean if only if i can't if i'm saying if i'm doing um uh, we had to do one shoot where we had to do a a a, a sri lankan wedding on the beach okay i they have something called a porva now i don't know what a porva was so i had to study the what is a porva why is it with this what so i will do that research okay so yeah because i'm talking so, with a stylist and a set designer so what colors will go and which yeah shape form same, utility form yeah so Amazing. yeah tell me uh, you know all these pro- projects that you've done the beautiful properties so you talk about the palaces yeah. you talk about uh, you know all these exotic locations that you've right. shot in right. beautiful properties yeah. architecture is amazing the ambiance is amazing yeah. has there been a instant where the when you entered into that space and you feel you found out that the place is really badly designed oh my god and was there a instant like this and then you really transformed that in a, in a photography I, i i would say not exactly that but i'll tell you what happens there's something called pre opening so when a hotel is built they spend so yeah. many hundreds of crores and they'll open the whole hotel in one time right they'll open first the you know bread and butter rooms and like the spas and residential suite comes later on so i've gone to hotels which are like literally construction sites where only certain areas are ready and you're like walking over concrete and all but there is one you know area ready those are challenging uh because everything the infrastructure is not there you know sometimes you'll do a shoot and you know they'll say yeah everything will be ready and then you'll realize but oh, the walls are beautiful lights there but the artwork hasn't come wo china se aa raha hai wo aayega aayega wo 15 days there a custom mein aata hai main idhar hu this wall we wrecky we said we'll do this planning lights so the wall is blank this happens a lot or so you're doing a restaurant shot and none of the cutlery crockery nothing is there so I'm like okay now what do i do here you know so you have experience and you turn them around all the time so we expect these things to happen <laughs> especially in pre openings keep the nerves basically and we just expect the worst you know literally <laughs> when you're doing pre openings great amazing and uh, coming to now you made a mark of your, for yourself in this industry you become you are one of the top photographers in this industry uh how are you giving back to the society i mean i i, I read that you also going as a lecturer guest lecturer to institutes of photography and uh, giving speaking about art and photography yeah um so very quickly uh when i was an assistant and i tried to meet photographers mm. in la when i wanted my internship they would not even entertain a phone call they would not even want to meet you and all of that so i used to feel i was like at least see what i have i know you may not have an opening so that pinched me a lot so i do a lot of talk uh, with schools whenever i'm invited but whenever i get a call from an assistant and i i can sense there is a sincere attempt to work even if i don't have an opening i will always come and say please come and meet me follow protocol don't come with a pen drive and say this is my portfolio no print your portfolio understand what happens to your colors come with a portfolio i will give you one hour of my time and answer whatever questions you want but don't come with you know like your phone or a pen drive and say is my portfolio or some will send me their link sir mera link hai check my portfolio out on instagram i'm not going to do that 
So if you can take the time and effort, even if I don't have an opening, I will see you. I'll spend an hour with you. I'll um, try and give you whatever feedback I can. So that's one way. And I do workshops, you know, also whenever required for schools. Amazing. Throughout this entire journey, would I have a lot of your assistants who have now become their own mm -hmm. photographers? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it must be really a proud moment for you to see them succeed and be, yes. you know, create a niche or a name for themselves. Yes, in the absolutely. And you know, they have they've been so inspirational. You know, some of my assistants that work with me, um, they've worked so hard and they've found problem solving so much. So they learn a lot with their work with me. They work a lot on camera. Um, you know, the, I, I expose them. I throw them in the deep end right away. So my when they leave my studio, they know a lot. You know, they work long enough. They're very fluent with my workflow. And I, because I will tell them, get on the camera. You know? okay. And when I'm doing shoots, uh, I did give them the, the lighting setup. And I usually, when I walk into the area, the whole, we work with two to three camera setup. So I have one crew is working on one area, one is working the other. So I'm fine tuning what's there. So they're very experienced when they leave. Now tell me from your personal uh, choice, Films, TPs, digital. <laughs> what do you love I the think, most? I think TPs, probably a lot of uh, viewers won't even know what TPs are. TPs, TPs is, are basically transparencies, a yeah. small slice, 30 times. You know, I try to explain that to people and they're like, really? Oh, okay. So you have, so let me expand on that. A lot of people are shooting film right now. Well, that's not what we really shot. We didn't, sh because they're shooting color negative. You know how it was. You've yeah. been in the business long enough. You only deliver transparencies to clients. Now, I'm not going to go through this whole thing. What a transparency is. But transparency had a error of one to one and a half. Not even one stop. I would say half a stop. If you're off by half a stop on transparency, you'd be dead. Negative, maybe three stops. You know, three, three and a half. Of course, your digital is giving you, even after you see the whole thing, perfect expose is still giving you almost 11 stops or eight or 11 stops latitude to play around with. So transparencies was a zero error. You can't make any mistake without seeing or a shoot. So uh, to me, that was the most fun and the most challenging. Uh, and I used to process my own film. You know, okay. my, I used to process my own transparencies. Oh, wow. So it was a, uh, yeah, transparency is the toughest. Toughest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> without a doubt. And I, I, we did transparencies. For uh, before digital, that's all I did. 12, uh, 92 to yeah, about 2001, yeah. 2010 years, we just shot yeah. transparency. You still have the light boxes? Oh, <laughs> shoot, yeah, man. No, I had to. I still have some of my processing cans, uh, okay. just as a token left, but I don't have those light boxes. And yeah. in digital, how do you find Do you find it? Uh, see, because it's uh, happening live, you see the results yeah. on the laptop. Like we were just talking. And especially when you have the marketing people, you have the yeah, clients yeah, yeah. behind you and looking at the laptop. And uh, you, when you click a shot, and then they say, okay, you know, ye thoda sa aisa hona chahiye, ye thoda sa aise karo. How do you take it as a professional, as a creative person? I mean, does it, do you accept that or do you, uh, you know, how do you handle that situations? Well, last eight to 10 years, I've hardly done any work with agencies. I work mostly with direct clients. Okay. So I don't have that issue. Even when clients are, uh, are there, I don't really have that issue. You know, every client, every person, uh, has their own way of doing it and you can communicate with them. I usually will explain to them, I, you know, very nicely. I say, listen, what you see on screen will probably change. And I see very often if there is a genuine creative call or there's genuine, I will take that suggestion Sorry. seriously. But if I know there's something which you yeah, color barabar nahi aara. I'm like, you know, if it's something so small, we say, well, listen, it's, it's we're just shooting. It'll have to go into editing and it'll, it'll change. But when they crowd around the, the 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 laptop while you're shooting, that can be a challenge. So, and coming to the newest trend, which is the AI. Yeah, yeah. Is, is, is it a tool that can be utilized or integrated, or do you see it as a uh, something which is disrupting uh, mm -hmm. the not just the photography, but I would also say the illustrations. So you know, here's where uh, interesting this conversation comes up. Uh, before while we are here today, photography started with photographers going taking a piece of glass, coating of chemicals in a dark room, putting it into the camera and then shooting. I'm sure when film came out, they must have said, yeah, yeah, it is so easy. Yeah, tumko ye sab karna hai. And then Polaroids are there and then digital came out. So if the medium is evolving. There is no point saying this is right or wrong. This is where it is going. Uh, I think there are so many genres of photography. People are going back to an analog look and an analog feel. Um, 
uh, I found a typewriter in my house, uh, an old typewriter, and my daughter, who's all, she's about 70, she's so kicked to see a typewriter. So she's like so excited about that. So I think what I'm trying to say is there is still a connect. People still romanticize um, analog, analog feel. There are filters in. So you're going to have a lot of, uh, you know, commercial work will be reliant on AI. Uh, there will probably be a time where you pay Virat Kohli for his avatar of AI. He'll license that to you. So he doesn't have to be there on a, on a set doing film. You know, if you want to do film in Paris or something, he's not there. You'll probably take his wireframe or something like that. They will... Yeah. I think uh, like during the World Cup, I think if I'm not mistaken, I saw Shubham Gill in one of uh, the, and he looked so. Uh, I mean, it looked like an AI right. avatar, yeah, because of the movement and yeah. the texture of the yeah, skin, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it looked like a uh, avatar, you know, of Shubham Gill who's talking yeah. to you. So, so you'll probably have a point where you'll just buy out these, yeah. you know, avatars of these people, rent it out. So there's no point fighting it. This is a commercial solution. It is the way it is going to be. But I think I mean, there will still be. People who romanticize analog you know, feel of pictures. So let's take some uh, questions from the live audience. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Jaidi. How do you ensure your photography stands out in a competitive market? Um, I really don't look at. I don't see it really that way anymore. You know, I. Um, so just to give this a quick. I'm not the best person to give marketing advice for <laughs> promoting yourself and competing with people. My website has been password protected. It always has been. It's not public. If somebody calls me for uh, what what do I do, then I give them a password and I may change the pictures to suit that brief. Um, you know, each person has to do their own thing. I've I've just found it to be a little more quiet and just to let your work do the talking. People who will want that sort of Work will find you. Fine. So it's it's that way. Great, man. I have another question from Siddhi. Hello, sir. How do you incorporate cultural elements into your work for a global audience? Okay. So what I'm doing, uh, I'm just going to be a little more specific. Global audience. So let's say there is somebody, Western people coming to say a palace, right? So I have to style that, compose that for an international audience. I think whether it's an Indian audience or international audience, if I'm shooting an Umayyad Bhavan palace and the beauty of that is there's this lawn and there's this peacock and you can have a champagne breakfast. If that's executed properly, you've got the champagne, you've got the peacocks, you've got the lawn, beautiful uh, Merangar fort in the background. That in itself is such an enticing story. It has all the elements, nature, fort, culture. It becomes a story. Then whether you're international or you're local, that communication just flows. But if I'm doing some office building out there, uh, or if I'm doing, a, not an office building, but say a, a business hotel, um, I, you know, I have to just keep it simple, a nice, more clean. Urban kind of a thing I'll say. Yeah, I just keep it more simple, clean. I don't think there's any specific language that you need to speak to communicate with somebody from Europe or whatever. Yeah. And I think, uh, like you mentioned, you know, if it's a resort, if it's a destination kind of a thing, then obviously the, the you know, the dreamy part, yeah. and then the, that kind of imagery yeah. definitely works. Yeah. And when it comes to more business of the city or the urban, Correct. and it's more crisper, yeah. because of the, you know, the way the sure. customers, yeah. the lifestyle is. And also a lot of our, whether it was Sri Lanka when I shot, or, you know, India where you shoot these exotic destinations, a beach story is a beach story, you know. Uh, whether you're Indian or, you know, from overseas, you'll just love to go on the beach. And that beach has to be shot in its glory and whatever. Uh, more than India, if you when you're traveling abroad for the shoots, you obviously must be doing a lot of research in terms of the cultural nuances locally over there. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to say, I haven't gone to, you know, very, very culturally strong places and short hotels there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you go with the flow. Uh, ultimately, if you're doing a food shot, the chef is the boss, right? He's designed it. So you understand what it is. Uh, so what we'll do is sometimes, for example, if I'm, uh, I may tweak his presentation a little bit mm -hmm. and work with him and understand what, the, you know, if it's a food shot for a hotel. So you will work with their culture and you want to make sure they're not violating or disrupting what yeah, they're doing. Exactly. Like that octopus story I told you. <laughs> <laughs> that was an interesting one. Yeah. Um, got another uh, question from G. Uh, what inspires you outside of photography? Do other formats of art, travel or personal experience shape your work? 
Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I don't look at any uh, one photographer who's inspired me. I think the only one person I can look at a photographer who's timeless is a guy called Irving Penn, a phenomenal photographer. And he does a lot of fashion. He does a lot of uh, beautiful still life. He, he shot till he was 92. More wow. Vogue covers than anyone. Uh, most expensive uh, images sold by him. And he was a very low profile, quiet guy, Irving Penn. You should check him out. Um, you have to, for the kind of work that I do and kind of work most photographers do, they do their own research in their own way because they're drawn to it. It's not work, it's just natural. So if I'm going on a holiday to say Japan, I remember this time when I went to Tokyo, I had friends there and I was like, I want to go to Amman, Tokyo, you know, because that's, it's like the Mecca of hotels yeah. and it's fantastic. So I went there and, uh, you know, had a meal there to understand how they present and, how, and I really enjoy that. So it's that, if it's music or it's books or it's travel, I do a lot of diving. So all these things culturally, you know, in, interest you. When I go to Mauritius and I go diving, I stay at a bed and breakfast there and I love their culture. So I will go and do my own cooking there. So I go with my kids and uh, you know, we'll buy stuff from there and we'll, we'll, we'll cook and we'll understand the culture and buy a good wine and understand about wine. And all this percolates to your luxury lifestyle that you're trying to uh, sell. If you do not do it and live it yourself, you can't fake it. Absolutely. You know, then you're just faking it. If you, mm. so I try and be as authentic with my own experiences, and it's a natural draw. Amazing. So. I think it's also connected to your uh, when you're shooting it. It's also the senses. Yeah. And when what you spoke right now, you're actually triggering those senses, or experiencing those senses. Yeah. 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 If you know if. Uh, uh, if you're a fashion photographer, you'll hang out, you'll go to these fashion shows, you'll hang out with designers, you'll go to these really good brands and you may not even buy all those clothes, but you'll know about it. What's the trend right now? You need to do this R&D. And if you're passionate about what you're shooting, researching it subconscious, it will automatically fill your experiences, even if you don't want it. Absolutely. As long as you're you know, interested in what you're doing. Great. Uh, I have another question from Yusuf. Uh, how has your photography style evolved over the years and what influenced those changes? I've never ever distinctly gone out to create a style. I, I never have. Okay. I know a lot of my assistants, uh, you know, some of them will say, you know, this, we saw this photographer and you know, he's trying to copy your style and all. I mean, I don't, uh, I've never tried to make a, uh, try to do a style. I've really gone with the flow. Uh, like, for example, I use a lot of artificial light in my work, but I don't think you will see that in my work. When you see my Instagram, you won't be able to tell how I've lit it and how I've not lit it. So that's my look and feel. Uh, that's, I think I, I like to be very authentic to that one directional light, one set of shadows. So, it, you know, we don't have two, three suns in our, you know, <laughs> so you won't have two, three shadows. It's as simple as that. So if it is a style that's come, I I, I didn't try anything out of But certainly I think people are looking at it as, a, you know, you see a yeah. particular picture and, but it's always it good to be open as yeah. a creative person, that you know, not me. Yeah. I don't, I don't go out and say, you know, I have to have grain and I have to have vignetting or I have to have this and that's my signature look. Mm, I don't have that. Great. And another interesting and a short question from Advait. He's asking, what's the most unusual request you have ever had from a client? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the most ridiculous request, uh, you know, is doing these stupid pre-openings sometimes. I mean, the place is not even ready. And that to me is, is the most unusual and the most ridiculous request because they expect you to go to this under construction site and they say, oh, exterior up ne kiya ne. I'm like, aapka patra nahi laga hoa hai. Aapka roof mo, unko photoshop mein nahi kar sakte hai. So that is very frustrating. I said, aap to fir pura 3D render hi laga lo na, mujhe kiyo bhej rao. You know, so those things are annoying, but Apart from that, nothing uh, out of the ordinary. Uh, everything is, uh, you know, whatever you get, if there, it's, a, it's a request, I don't see it as odd. I see that as, oh, this is fun. So uh, you, do you, I mean, especially in this kind of cases, do you find yourself actually educating the client as a uh, as an add-on kind of a thing that they understand uh, from your perspective? People that I've worked with a lot, like... Uh, <laughs> Uh, people like Taj. See, earlier on it was different. You yeah. would work with the brand, the main central brand would send you, the, the head office would send you to do shoots. Now it's changed. The hotels are doing their own thing. In, so individual property. very often I, I will work with that one person and then maybe after five years I'll bump into them again on another property. Um, 
So you can educate them to the moment, but I just believe that from start to finish, this is the process, this is my workflow. Uh, this is the way it has to be. There's no improvising, there's nothing because we've tried and we've seen what works and what doesn't work. So I suppose at the end of the whole should they understand why we've asked to do what and that works out. Uh, another question from Siddharth is asking, are there any misconceptions people have about lifestyle and luxury photography? Yeah. I mean, it looks all pretty on the image. Yeah. So I think lifestyle and luxury, you know, it's to me, it's more of a, uh, of little, little pieces that you put together that make one story. So it's not like, uh, you know, okay, I'll, I'll just wear this really expensive pair of jeans, which are super expensive. But what are you going to put with that? What shirt are you going to wear? What accessories are you going to put with it? It's harmony of different elements that you put together. It's not just one thing. Okay. So the misconception not that if you just buy this expensive thing, are, is that going with that? Is it matching? Is it creating a, is it creating a harmony? Is it creating an ensemble? I think that, you know, you don't need to have everything expensive, everything brand, you know, heavy okay. brands. A uh, few more questions. Okay, Asad is saying that I saw Jaydeep sir's profile and so inspired by his journey. And thanks, uh, Niket, for inviting him. Thank you. Uh, Meera is asking, I want to know how do you balance technical skills with creative vision in photography? What technical skills? You don't need I any more it's, technique. It goes no. hand in hand. It's like this. No. Back. So, Actually, it's an interesting question. This is there is no longer a technique issue required anymore. I mean, we've learned on transparencies and printing on your own and black and white. Technique is out of the window now. Your phones do everything. Your cameras are getting AI. Everything is getting smarter and interesting and clever. I just think you know today is so easy. It is so easy to go into a, an interior and just shoot it with different lights and you know different color temperature. It works out great. Um, I think technique is redundant now. It's damn easy to shoot. Sure. It's difficult to tell a, a, a story, but its technique is redundant now. Yukti, uh, hi Mr. Jaydeep, can you also throw some light on the phone photography as we all have it handy these days? There's nothing to throw light on. I see so many ads, workshop on iPhone photography and this. Uh, phone photography, what is it? You know, my child does it. I mean, it's uh, there's, there's nothing. Just take the picture. If it looks good, just press the button. Pick a filter and put it together. There is not much. The only tip I will tell you, I mean, it's a stupid tip, but you know, try and clean your damn lens of your phone clean. <laughs> because half the time, it's a small detail, but just try and just keep your lens clean. That's it. And, um, you know, use your filters. Maybe just shoot it uncompressed with, with using no compressions. Try and see the purest raw form. And shoot it. Great. Uh, very interesting uh, person who has asked this question. His name is Kavir Abhoray. Mm. <laughs> and he's online. So what is your favorite memory and experience on a shoot? Well, that's definitely with Kabir Obroy. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's it's funny. Uh, hi, Kabir. Uh, it's funny. I thought a very interesting shoot was during COVID. I was called to shoot Umed. Okay. Umed Bhavan Palace is the most one of the most expensive hotels in the world. Uh, you had Katy Perry uh, get married. Priyanka Chopra got married there. Very exclusive hotel. And we went in peak season. Uh, to shoot the hotel and uh, the entire hotel was empty and uh, Kabir, my son came with me out there and we went with the crew and we had to shoot this, you know, uh, I think it was a six or a seven day shoot. We said, you know what, we need to wait for the lights. So we extended the shoot by a day or two. We said, don't worry, we won't charge you for the extra two days. And we had one of the most beautiful, beautiful shoots because there's nobody in the hotel. The whole hotel is with you and you created these beautiful pictures. You took your own time. The light was great. I think that was one of the most fun shoots uh, we've had and I got to you know, bond with my boy also. Okay. How old is he? Kabir is now 20. He just turned oh, 20. 20. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope Kabir, uh, <laughs> you got the answer to your uh, question from your dad. <laughs> oh, he's also written something. He wakes up really early, <laughs> sets all the angles and usually two to three shots at a time then it's just about blowing out fires all day. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah, that's, he doesn't enjoy that too much but yeah, we have to. Chirad is asking, can you talk about a specific photo that you feel best represented your style and what's the story behind it? Don't, 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 uh, that's a very, very tough question. I promise you, it's, I look at, you know, I can look at my Instagram. I post very little on Instagram. 
I post only what I think has some connection. Some, I think every shot there has a little bit of an interest, you know, a little bit of a story behind it. Um, so it's hard. It's really hard to, uh, you know, to put that. But yes, there are a couple of shots that have really stood out. The most of the experiential shots that we do. There's one particular one that I think kind of jumps out. Um, uh, it was for Devi Ratan. We did a dining experiential shot. I thought that was kind of interesting because out of nowhere in an under construction, literally under construction situation again, we had to create an experiential shot and that's just beautiful. That, that worked out. But there's a lot of luck required also. I want uh, everything. All the elements fell into yeah. place. The light was right. Just things that we took a gamble on just paid off. Ishak Fai is asking, if given the chance, which historical moment would you capture and why? Jeez, what a lovely question. <sighs> You know, I think, I don't know if it's cliche, but I think the the Independence Day, you know, when India got its independence, that morning, the euphoria that must have been is, is such a path-breaking moment, right? The British were there, we had this politically rich environment out there. I think that would be such a great day to take, you know, portraits of people, of leaders, of, I think that would be... Probably an interesting, very interesting I know, day. Right, and movement and the yeah, the it's, it must have exploded the yeah, emotions. So many hundred years, uh, well, not so many, a couple of hundred years with British there, and it was this lovely moment. I think that would be just imagine, you know, the morning of the Independence Day, how people must have felt. Uh -huh. So I think that would be interesting. Jason is asking whether can you walk us through a day in your life during a major shoot. Honestly, the day of the shoot for me, I don't take any stress. When I'm shooting, all my stress is out. It's creative, it's problem solved. I take my own time. I don't rush my shots. Um, I'll take enough, you know, uh, I'll pace myself out. I don't rush. It's all the stuff that happens before that day is nerve wracking. It's stressful because if you finish all that groundwork, then that day becomes just this beautiful creative process. I'm not going to entertain any last minute, you know, googlies by, you know, a client because jo aapko karna tha, tell me before. So typically, my day will start, I'm talking about a full day if I'm catching uh, sunrise. Usually we'll have two camera setups at least. So they'll be in two different areas. Uh, we'll probably show up at about two in the morning okay. because, you know, then there'll be a nice coffee session at 2, 2.30 by the time lights are being set up. And then we'll start and we'll make sure we catch sunrise. Then we take a quick breakfast and then we start our day going through shot by shot. And the way it works is, you know, uh, I'm working on one set by the time the next shot is being ready. When I finish with this, I just move to the next set by, and these guys will start setting up the next. So I'm kind of just moving from one set up to another and everything is planned the day before. Uh, one very funny question from my end. Uh, if your camera wants to tell you something, uh, what will it tell you? Jeez, if my camera, <laughs> no, my camera will thank me. My camera, she's very pampered. You know? okay. uh, yeah, yeah, because. So how many cameras, how, how, okay, how many cameras do you have? Till date. We have, I mean, do you right. have one particular, <laughs> your favorite one? I do, I'm not just saying this because, you know, I'm a Canon brand ambassador, but I do like Canon as a brand. Uh, all brands are good. Whatever works for you is fine. Canon works for me. Um, I have a few of them. I like the perspective control lenses, which allow you to uh, control perspective on, on camera. Those are beautiful. Old school optics, beautiful optics. Um, so I like that. I think my camera and all my equipment uh, will be thankful because I take great care of my equipment. Yeah. I always tell my assistants, I said, these are, the studio is a temple. These are your idols. Nice. You need to make sure that you are very respectful to them. And um, yeah, so I don't abuse my equipment. <laughs> Service them on time. Keep them away from humidity. And, great. Uh, and any uh, advice for, uh, you know, uh, young photographers yeah. or uh, students who are looking at photography as a career, uh, what would you advise them in today's uh, generation and today's time? So there are two paths to photography if you take. One path is commissioned work and one path is creative work, as in personal work. Commissioned work is somebody calling you, giving you some money and saying, you are going to create this for me. Or you have fine art where you come, you have already created your art and then you're going to sell that. Just because you've got an Instagram account, you've got 
Facebook and you're posting all these personal pictures and they're probably really good. But it doesn't mean that they are going to necessarily make great commercial photographers. That requires a lot of discipline. That requires a, a strong business mind, great paperwork. Now you should be spending enough time on Word and Excel as much on Photoshop. It literally becomes that way. There are contracts and now things are made complicated. So my advice is if you, if you want to do photography for yourself to enjoy, then uh, that's fine. But commercial photography is a different ball game. Okay. It's like if you love wildlife and you want camps and you want to do a lot of these uh, wildlife photography, that's that's great. But it may not translate to, uh, may or may not, I'm not saying it doesn't. It might be difficult to earn a living. In that case, do something where you make so much money that you can keep going every month, you know, or every two months and enjoy that without any commercial pressure. Okay. So decide what you want to do and why you want to do it. Okay. Because it's, not, it's just like a business, you know, when you shoot, you're an artist, but before you come to that set, you've got your advance in hand. It's hardcore business. You have to negotiate. You have to be sharp with your, you know, advances, balances. What if you do a shoot and you deliver the picture and they don't pay you? What are you going to do? Hmm. So you have to have those riders in place. So the business part and the creative oh, part. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ready for both 100%. of them. 100%. And are, is there, are there any specific institutes in India that you would recommend for uh, young budding uh, students um, which are really deliver really good stuff you know again there are uh, i think after covid there's been a lot of change in photography uh, i think there are quite a few i think bharati vidya peet is one there is light and life academy in, in uti that's one i don't know if there are others i may be missing out on some i know these two institutes i've been to both of them they both serve different purposes there may be others i'm not sure but oh. these two i'm familiar with Okay, I'm coming to the end. I'm having a surprise rapid fire. Oh God! For you. Okay, fine. <laughs> it's, it's don't worry. It's not like oh, a fire joke. <laughs> <laughs> so, film or digital? Uh, okay, I'm gonna go with film. Okay. Studio shoot or outdoor? Outdoors. Black and white or color? Black and white. <laughs> okay, this I'm skipping because Canon or Nikon or Hasselblad. I know <laughs> which one uh, the answer for that could be. Raghurai or David Lachapelle? <sighs> no, Raghurai. <laughs> so far the best location the property you have shot uh, so far the best location or the best property either of them um, location and property you can give both I would say the best property that I've shot that I've enjoyed most that I'm in awe with has been Omen uh, beautiful it speaks and the best location I think uh, Sri Lanka Maldives is you can't touch those two I mean I'll, I'll name two uh, mm -hmm. Sri Lanka and Maldives are just incredible to work in and the weirdest thing you've done for a shot? The weird. I told you, we jump in on, <laughs> on uh, off Maldives. That was weird. But we've done, you know, Great hanging out of a chopper that. and all of that stuff. So thanks, Jaydeep. Uh, thanks Thank you, for your, Thank you. all your insights and all the, the uh, you know, all the insights you uh, shared through your journey as a photographer. Okay. I think it has helped uh, the budding photographers and also thrown some light through the business owners from the business perspective yeah. that how important it is uh, for the photography to not just sell your uh, property but also create a brand yeah. uh, image for your company. Okay. So thank you so much thank Jenny, you, you. for uh, yeah. accepting this invitation and being a part of this and I would also like to thank uh, CCD for uh, yeah. you know hosting this particular Thinkly talk Talks uh, in that location and uh, it's the start of, it's the first very first episode and I think it will have some really good conversations way ahead as the years go by. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikit. Thank you, Sister. So much. I didn't realize everybody was listening. <laughs>